Okay, so this is the lecture on Saint Ignatius. We're just going to be going through his life and his life drama today. And again, this is just to help us begin to introduce ourselves to some of the elements from the Jesuit and Ignatian tradition that inform the life of this university, the goals, mission, and identity of this university. So this will be our first direct introduction to things Jesuit, and it's fitting that it should begin with St. Ignatius himself. So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Fill our minds with the light of your truth. Move us from where we are. Change us from who we are. Guide us to where you want us to be. And transform us into your likeness. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I thought I would take a broader view to begin with. And think about the difference that one life can make. So we're here at a Jesuit university that is informed and guided by the mission and witness of St. Ignatius and the community that he helps to found. And so it's not only that the world would be very different if there were no St. Ignatius, although that's true, but I think that's true for each and every human individual. But this university would be very different. And we who are here participating in the life and work of this university are here in part because there was a St. Ignatius. So we really wouldn't be here if it weren't for him and what he did and how he lived out his particular life. So the Society of Jesus was established in 1540 and the University of Scranton became a Jesuit university in 1942, taking it over from the Christian brothers who ran the university before that. So we have some clear markings of St. Ignatius's influence here at the university. There is the statue pictured there in the upper right by the German sculptor Gerhard Baut. It was commissioned, I believe, in 1988. Uh, and arrived on campus, and the title of this sculpture is Metanoia, which of course means conversion or change of mind, and it depicts the moment where Saint Ignatius strips himself of his armor and leaves his weapons at the altar of Our Lady at Montserrat. So he's holding out his sword to give it to Our Lady, to leave it there, not to stab himself, as some people think. And there's a statue of St. Ignatius's head right at the entrance of the altar, or at the entrance of the theater, rather, uh, here on campus. So if you ever want to go rub St. Ignatius's head, you could go to the entrance of uh, the theater building, uh, McDade Hall, I believe it is, and uh, you can find his herm there. It's just sort of a statue of his head. Okay, so thinking along these lines, often people invoke a butterfly effect where a butterfly flaps its wings and then this eventually leads to or contributes to something more dramatic down the line of causation, like a hurricane or something like that. Thinking about it theologically or from a supernatural perspective though, we can recognize that all of these events are somehow foreseen. So if every decision has far-reaching consequences, from our perspective, we can only see some of them. Some of these consequences we can foresee, others we can't. But God sees them all and sees them all in relation to one another. So given those premises, one can conclude that God knew every effect St. Ignatius's life would have, including the effects on you and me. Uh, which I think is beautiful to think about. So in these parts of Ignatius's life, these turning points, these decisions that he makes, there's direct effects that go all the way to you and me here at a university that is uh, run by the order that he founded. So in God's mind, there's always been a link between St. Ignatius and us. 
And so we don't have to kind of make it up um, or torturously connect the dots that every effect of his decisions, his actions was already in God's mind. And that includes those effects that impact us, you and me. Now, St. Ignatius's impact on my own life, I just thought I would mention as, as an example, I became a Catholic in a Jesuit parish in Durham, North Carolina. I, I was searching, I was looking for um, a faith community, a faith tradition, and found this traditionally black parish run by the Jesuits in Durham, North Carolina. I was a student at, at Duke at the time, and this informed my faith. I became a Catholic my senior year after three years and some of RCIA. And it also informed my education, it shaped what I studied, it shaped my intellectual life and its formation. And I eventually went to get my master's degree in theology at a Jesuit university, Boston College, which is also where I met my wife. And I was married by a Jesuit priest, uh, an ex a uh, Green Beret who became a Jesuit, and I now find myself teaching at a Jesuit university. So certainly in my case, uh, St. Ignatius laid a lot of the groundwork for the things that would be pivotal to my own life. And um, maybe some of you have similar experiences with the Jesuits and the Society of Jesus. All right, well, let's get going on St. Ignatius's life. So St. Ignatius was a uh, boisterous, flamboyant young man, uh, and he was born into a very wealthy family. His name, uh, his given name at birth is uh, Inigo Lopez de Loyola. My Spanish accent is terrible, I apologize for that. And he was born one year before Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1491. He was one of 13 children, the last son in this group of children, and he belonged to a noble Basque family, so a uh, landed prominent family in the Basque region of Spain. The Basques are fascinating. They have their own language, they have their own customs and cultures, and um, quite different from the mainstream Spaniards. So his parents were Beltran de Loyola and Marina Sanchez de Licona, and they were the Lord and Lady they were um, the Duke and Duchess. I'm not sure what their exact title was, but they were nobles. Uh, and they had a giant castle in this place called uh, Epeitia, I think it is, or Epeitia. And um, they lived in this northern region of Spain um, and raised their 13 children. So Ignatius was, so this was the environment in which he grew up. He grew up <coughs> dreaming of being a swashbuckler, uh, Hidalgo. A caballero, some uh, fighting uh, gallant knight. And he had a very active imagination, so he saw himself in this role of the gallant, uh, valiant fighter, sort of like my son with his uh, play lightsaber even today. Uh, each of his brothers, except for one, was some kind of soldier or conquistador. Um, he had a brother who was a priest, uh, all the other brothers, however, went off to one war or another, one expedition or another. They were adventurers, and many of them met a violent death. He was originally placed in a pre-seminary, so this was traditional in these types of family situations. The older sons went off to gain wealth, glory, uh, power. The younger sons were often given to the church. So it makes sense that the last son would go into the priestly track to get kind of, you know, the spiritual good graces and all of that. But it became very clear that he wasn't really priest material at this time. And so he was transferred to a kind of finishing school or an apprenticeship in a royal court. Royal courts at this time not only had the royalty themselves, they not only had servants, but they had lots of hangers on lots of um, people surrounding the nobles and the uh, royals to um, kind of solidify their power, to create connections, and to um, create a kind of uh, community. So um, in these settings where you know people were rich, people were powerful, he became very obsessed with his own appearance, his own persona. 
He wore shoulder length hair. He had elaborate facial hair, a mustache, and he rocked uh, the standard fashionable garb for the time, a cuirass, a coat of mail, uh, a slashed doublet, a elaborate hat. I mean, just think of like Inigo Montoya, but even more uh, geared out and even maybe more flamboyant. He wore the tights of the day, these knee-high socks, the knee-high boots. Uh, he cut quite um, a image in these courts and took advantage of it in his relations with the ladies. He says he was fairly free in the love of women. So he was sort of immersed in this romantic world of the courtier, or you might even think of like the three musketeers. This was the sort of character that he was aiming to be. And he was also pugnacious. He had a quick temper and was quick to fight with others. He knew how to use a sword and other weapons. He says he delighted in the exercise of arms. One of the results of his fights was um, arrest and temporary incarceration. So as a side note here, he's one of the few saints that has a police record. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Father James Martin makes a note of that too. And again, he had these frequent flights of fancy, sometimes even delusion. He had this delusion about how he was going to win over this uh, princess uh, who eventually became queen of Portugal. And so he just had these very outsized ambitions and dreams as a young man. So full of spirit, full of fight, known for his flair, his charm, his machismo, but also his courage, his loyalty, his fastidiousness, everything about him was just so. Um, and he made sure it was just so to fit in with his whole persona. All of this, though, comes to a crashing halt at the Battle of Panplona in May 1521. So the background of this battle is that the Spanish seized this fortress that originally belonged to the French on this border region uh, at the Pyrenees Mountains where Spain meets France. So it was kind of a little border skirmish. Uh, several hundred French troops come to reclaim this fortress. It's held only by a handful of Spanish soldiers, but uh, Inigo was one of them. And the battle lasted quite a long time. Uh, it says after nine hours, a French cannonball, an, an artillery shell, exploded at Inigo's feet. And even with his armor, he was grievously wounded. He, it sounds like he, well, he was really lucky to survive, actually. So both his legs were wounded. So he was a casualty in this battle, but his right leg in particular was shattered. I'm not sure if it was a compound fracture or just multiple fracture, but his right leg was in, in really bad shape from this cannonball. But the thing that is shattered most of all is Inigo's self-image, his appearance, his ability to live out this persona that he has set out for himself. His leg heals badly. He fights with infection. Again, it seems like he's very lucky to survive uh, recurrent long-lasting fevers. And on top of that, his leg heals crookedly. His, his leg heals badly, so his, his right leg is um, misshapen. It's skewed. So they have to re-break the leg and reset it, all of this without anesthetic. And even when they manage to do that and get it relatively straight, the right leg ends up being shorter than the left one. And there's like a bulb or um, a bony uh, prominence right under his right knee jutting out. And this does not look good with his tights. I mean, imagine if you're you know, wearing these uh, tight leg coverings, it would almost be accentuate this uh, small deformity. And also he must have had trouble walking with one leg shorter than another. It would have been a, a limp. He couldn't strut around the way that he used to. So he takes some drastic measures to preserve his appearance. He tries to have his legs stretched. There was like a stretching machine, sounds like a torture machine. And he also has this bulb chiseled and shaved away. And he looks back on it as just sheer butchery, this effort to make his leg go back to normal. Uh, he looks back on it as a, a kind of martyrdom to his own pleasure. So after a while, you know, after the fevers are gone and he's going to survive, he does all this extra stuff just to try to preserve his appearance. 
But you can imagine this was very traumatic to him and he has to uh, convalesce for over a year. So he was laid up uh, in his family's castle for at least a year. And in this situation, he's isolated. He's unable to uh, interact socially, to be a part of the court that he was a part of. He finds himself in a weakened condition. You can imagine his muscles would be atrophying and he finds himself with a disability. Um, he can't really uh, walk, he certainly can't run, he can't fight, he can't do all the things that he enjoyed to do before. But above all that, he is bored, bored out of his mind. And he searches the house and has a servant search for anything and everything to read. He wants to read these medieval chivalrous stories of uh, daring do and fighting and saving the um, maiden in distress and all of that. But turns out they don't have that type of literature you know like probably wants to read the equivalent of like you know james patterson or you know some action novel when he's uh, there but the only thing they have for him to read is an extended biography of our lord and an anthology of saints so he reads these two books and then he rereads them and he reads them over and over and over and he must have been very bored but he comes to um appreciate them comes to uh, develop a fondness for these stories. And it eventually brings about a change in perspective. And this is really where his conversion occurs. His way of thinking starts to change, but it starts to change in continuity with his previous way of thinking. So he's attracted to glory and adventure, but he begins to imagine different forms of glory and adventure. He begins to imagine himself uh, taking on this spiritual, uh, sense of glory. And he asked himself, well, what it would be like if I did what they did? Could I do that, what they did? Could I win this kind of glory and renown for myself? So he's still kind of thinking uh, in a vain way, in a sort of self-centered way, but it's, it's directed in a new uh, direction. He has a new orientation, but his same old ambition. <clears throat> and he also discovers that when he thinks about his old desire for worldly achievements, he feels a sense of desolation afterwards. Maybe it's because he couldn't really bring it about, couldn't pull it off. But when he thinks about spiritual achievements, when he indulges his ambition through spiritual dreams and fantasies, he, he gets a sense of consolation. He feels uplifted. And so he develops this method of discernment from his experience being uh, incapacitated for a year that one should al always follow what gives one consolation and be suspicious of that which leaves one in a state of desolation. Okay, so when he finally is able to move again and get out of the house, he begins a, a spiritual journey. And like everything he's done up to this point, he doesn't go halfway. Before though, he has a, he has a vision of Our Lady while he is um, in, in his bed. He sees Our Lady with the infant Jesus, and he connects this both to his past life. He develops a, a deep loathing for his past life and sees the vanity that was there. And this vision also confirms his desire to go to Jerusalem, to the holy city, where Jesus died and rose again. Um, he had this plan, he was hatching it in his mind, and his vision cements it. He's going to try to do it. His family resists this new religious enthusiasm of his by showing him all the wealth that, that he could rely on and uh, have if he remains in his family, but uh, he decides he, he's going to pursue his plans, and so he goes to a pilgrimage site not too far away in the mountains um, between France and uh, Spain called Montserrat. This was a shrine that many people would have pilgrimages to, where there's the Black Madonna. I should have included a picture of it here, but it only had so much room. There is a replica of the Black Madonna in the Sacred Heart Chapel here at the university, if you ever want to go there. So the statue is of the moment where he gives over his weapons to Our Lady of Montserrat, the Black Madonna, and the Black Madonna itself can be found in the chapel. So there's uh, little, little tokens of this particular moment in his life on campus here. When he's at this shrine, he gives away his clothes, so he divests himself of his courtly 
garb and he puts on instead the sackcloth, so like a burlap sack and rope sandals of a penitent pilgrim. So this is another mark of his change that he's undergoing. And of course he leaves his weapons there at the altar of Montserrat. And then he makes his way to the port of uh, Barcelona where he hopes to get a ship to go to Jerusalem. But he hears about um, a group of people in Barcelona at the time that would know him, recognize him, and maybe tempt him back to his old life. And so he stays at a little town north of Barcelona called Manresa. And there he becomes a beggar and a hermit. He's called Old Man Sack, which is a really unfortunate nickname. Uh, he begs, he undergoes extreme forms of asceticism, and sometimes even lives in a cave there. He calls this, you know, his own uh, initial uh, church that, that he experiences living as a, as a hermit on his own there. Um, but the forms of asceticism that he places upon himself make him ill, weak, and even lead him to despair. There was a, a moment even when he wanted to kill himself. So one could even think like he might have descended into mental illness here. <laughs> but the picture on the bottom left is the cave, which is now a little chapel where St. Ignatius spent these, these days in between uh, his conversion and um, his, his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And when he is at Manresa, there's a moment where he's standing by the Cardinaire River, the river nearby, and he says he experienced an illumination, a kind of second conversion, which leads him away from this extreme form of fasting and mortification and away from an obsession with his past life. He experienced what's called scruples, which is continually thinking about and obsessing over his past sins. So he was freed from this somehow at this particular moment when he was by the river. And um, his spiritual life after this takes on a much more natural, organic quality. Okay, so then after he leaves Manresa, he sets off to Jerusalem. He does find his way there, and he intends to live there permanently. He wants to stay there. He visits all the sites that are associated with Jesus's life and ministry and just loves it. But he's forced to leave when Turkish soldiers begin threatening the pilgrims there and the Pope orders all the Christians out. So I suppose he could have stayed and uh, hidden there, but he decides to obey the directive and has to return to Spain where he begins his studies. Wasn't much of a student before, and so now he has to begin, kind of like Billy Madison, uh, in classes for younger people. So when he starts to learn Latin, he has to be in this class with nine and ten-year-olds. That's what the picture there is uh, showing. And this is at the University of Barcelona. He eventually makes his way to the University of Alcala, where he studies the liberal arts there, um, Albert the Great's physics, um, and the uh, sentences of Peter Lombard. He studies logic, rhetoric, and all the liberal arts. Um, he has, gets kicked out of there, I'll explain why in a second, and goes to the University of Salamanca, which is probably the most prestigious university at the time in Spain, and studies moral theology or ethics with the Dominicans that run that university. But in Alcala and in Salamanca, he becomes a target of the Spanish Inquisition, which, yes, is still around at the time. He gives talks and classes to people publicly, uh, you might think of them more as like um, um, impromptu homilies or devotional recollections. And he's not done with his studies yet, so he's still a student, a uh, bit of a loose cannon, but people are very moved by these talks in any case. And so this draws the suspicion of the inquisitors. And upon examination, he's placed in jail twice because he seems to run afoul of the standards of, of orthodoxy uh, at the time. And this happens in Alcala, that's why he gets kicked out of that town. And it also happens in Salamanca with even greater speed because the Dominicans, you know, they're right on it. All right, so after he has another jailing in Salamanca, he decides he has to get out of Spain. So he walks the 700 miles to Paris in 1528. So he's 37 years old at the time. So he's not super young. He, he's a full-grown adult. I mean, early, middle age even. 
And uh, he starts to study at the University of Paris, which is the, uh, still the intellectual center of Europe at this time. And he begins studying at some of the colleges in the Sorbonne. There he um, mismanages his money and ends up having to continue to beg and scrape and find what work or shelter he can. But crucially, he starts to develop friendships with other students there. And he starts to develop a technique for spiritual reflection in the form of a retreat that he calls the spiritual exercises. It's a 30-day retreat that focuses on all of salvation history and tries to apply it to one's individual life. So he gives these retreats to his friends that include a Frenchman, his first companion, Pierre Favre, or Peter Faber, as he's sometimes known, Francisco de Javier, or Francis Xavier, uh, a Portuguese gentleman by the name of Samuel Rodriguez, and a bunch of Spaniards, Diego Lainez, Alfonso Saron, Nicolas de Bobadilla. And then towards the end, Pierre Favre gets some more Frenchmen, Frenchmen to join, Claude de Jay, Pascal Broé, and Jean Codur. So this is the initial group that comes to form what will be known as the Society of Jesus. And it's Peter uh, Faber, or Pierre Favre, that uh, gets ordained first. And during his first mass, they make a kind of dedication of their lives to their ministry. But in the meantime, Ignatius takes on a new name, uh, Ignacio in the Spanish, or Ignatius is the Latinized firm. So, we're not really sure exactly why he changes his name here, maybe to become more formal, maybe to mark this important transition in his life. But it's in Paris that he takes on the name Ignatius. So at communion during Peter Faber's first mass, Ignatius and his friends dedicate themselves to a life of poverty and service. And they vow either to go to Jerusalem or to present themselves to the Pope for whatever service the Pope might ask of them. So these are their two long-term options. They do go to the Pope and get permission to go to Jerusalem, but it doesn't work out as we'll see. And I should mention in the meantime, not everybody is a fan of Ignatius. Uh, people still kind of want to suppress him and his order is eventually suppressed um, for a period of time uh, in the, uh, I believe it's, um, well, it's hundreds of a uh, couple hundred years later. Uh, one enemy in particular at the time, though, was this cardinal, Carafa, and he would eventually become pope and would tinker with the society, particularly after Ignatius died, uh, but was hostile from the beginning to what Ignatius was, was trying to do uh, because it was kind of radical at the time. So, um, Pope Paul the Fourth's predecessor, Pope Paul III, does give them permission to go to Jerusalem, but is doubtful that they'll succeed, and in fact they don't because it becomes too dangerous to sail there. Uh, they all gather in Venice hoping to catch a ship to Jerusalem, but uh, there are pirates, there are uh, hostile uh, Turks, and so no ships go eastward. <clears throat> so they take plan B and go to Rome and offer themselves to the Pope, who finds them jobs, um, Pierre Faber, and um, I think Francis Xavier as well are given teaching jobs, and Ignatius is assigned to uh, a church and to various uh, forms of service there. So the Pope finds jobs for them. And it's there that they begin to establish the foundations, the constitution, and the form of life that will come to be known as the Society of Jesus. And St. Ignatius is elected the first leader or superior general of the Society of Jesus in 1541. So he's 50 years old at the time. And this is where he ends up for the rest of his life for the next uh, 15 years. And in that time, he dedicates himself primarily to just doing clerical work, administrative tasks. He writes letters. This is one of his specialties. So he has over 7,000 letters that we still have today. And they take up 12 volumes, 12 full volumes. Uh, so he was quite prolific, but not with like academic work. Um, but with relationships, with correspondence. 
and he stays basically where he's at. Uh, this adventurer, this swashbuckler, basically becomes a homebody, facilitating other people's adventures and journeys all over the world. So Francis Xavier would end up in uh, East Asia, in you know Macau, Japan. Um, I think he even stopped in India. Um, so this is what St. Ignatius ends up dedicating his life to in the end, making it possible for this community to survive and to do its particular work. And in doing that, he changes the world. So the Jesuit charism or gift or special distinctive quality um, is mainly in the areas of mission work and teaching or schools. So most of these early Jesuits become either missionaries or teachers, founding missionary efforts to establish churches or to uh, found schools. And this becomes like their primary specialty eventually, hence our school. But the whole uh, way of life is meant to uh, cultivate active mobile priests, ready to go wherever they're sent, ready to follow orders, and ready to go to places where other people aren't ready to go. So many of the early missionaries, even in our own country, uh, like Jacques Marquette, for instance, were Jesuits. Uh, Jacques Marquette is also known for kind of discovering uh, the Mississippi River, at least from the European perspective. Um, so this is nicely captured by the title that they give to their first church in Rome, Madonna della Strada, which is the name of our main chapel here. And it means Our Lady of the, <coughs> excuse me, Our Lady of the Road, Our Lady of the Way, or my favorite translation, Our Lady of the Wayside. Because it not only emphasizes um, mobility and travel, but also marginality or liminality. You go not only um, continually from one place to another, but you go to the places that are marginalized, that are out of the way, that nobody else will go to. This really kind of captures the Jesuit charism. <clears throat> so St. Ignatius also becomes a prominent remote spiritual guide to people, and his spiritual guidance has a particular quality that will come to mark the order that he founds. He serves as a spiritual father through his letters mainly. Uh, so not directly, but through correspondence. And his advice was not always the same to people. It wasn't consistent. It was really tailored to each and every individual, which is where we now get this ideal of cure personalis or care of the person, individualized uh, care or engagement. And also this uh, practical spiritual principle of the agere contra, the going against. So if Ignatius found somebody who was particularly uh, lazy or lax, he would give them advice to buckle down, to uh, you know, gain motivation and to sort of increase their uh, fervor. If you had somebody who was super scrupulous, he would tell them to back off, to not be so uptight. Um, so his advice really was tailored to each and every individual's needs. The spiritual exercises continue to be a, a keystone of the order, uh, not only for formation, but also for outreach. Uh, the spiritual exercises really lay down the whole theological, spiritual perspective of the Jesuit Ignatian spirituality. So Ignatius in his final days leads by example. He pushes himself to the very end, working harder than those who were surrounding him. Um, he relinquished his obsession with extreme asceticism, but he still remained very disciplined and would often take on uh, forms of, of fasting um, and other sacrifices that others didn't. But it took a toll on his health. So by 1556, his health, which was never good, begins to fail. And those assistants around him don't uh, get priests and a papal blessing in time before he dies. And so he ends up dying alone at, in the night on January 31st, 1556. So there was no martyrdom, there was no fanfare. But nevertheless, his life was a powerful witness to the supremacy of spiritual power over wealth, over military force, over um, even external 
charisma. He uh, changed the world primarily with his prayer, with his personal correspondence, with his care of each and every person that he interacted with. And that's how he gained his community, it's how he sustained his community, and it's how he set it in motion to where it is today. And his legacy continues all over the world, even here, but all the way to Rome, where we have our first uh, and only Jesuit Pope, who is uh, still um, you know, occupying the Sea of Peter today, and um, thousands of schools, universities, um, and the Jesuits are still uh, very active and influential today, particularly at a place like this. So uh, that's it for today. Um, thanks for listening, and I will see you guys in class where we'll talk about St. Ignatius a little bit more.